So, Monica, you are from New Zealand. Yes, that's right. So, for people going to New Zealand, what would you recommend? What are three or four places that you must see in New Zealand? Oh, okay. Three or four places you must see. Well, depends what you're looking for, really. I think a lot of people that come to New Zealand enjoy an outdoor lifestyle. So there's lots of outdoor activities and places you can go to to enjoy in New Zealand. Um, personally, I find the South Island of New Zealand very scenic in comparison to the North Island. So for me, um, a must-do is the west coast of the South Island. It's very pretty. The west coast. Yeah. Um, in particular, there's two glaciers, Franz Joseph and Fox Glaciers, um, which are very stunning to look at. And you can either have a look at them by foot or you can pay for a helicopter ride that takes you up and um, shows you an aerial view of them. Now, do people ever walk across the glaciers? Um, there are guides that can walk you across. Yeah, I haven't done it personally, but um, it is possible. So what else would you recommend for New Zealand? What other places should people see? Um, I think if you want to see, um, let me think, rural New Zealand, it's quite a nice idea to drive the length of the country, and then you can see... Um, the interesting farming that has taken place, um, in particular in the South Island, the lower part of the South Island, and um, a lot of the North Island as well. Um, there's a lot of sheep in New Zealand, and there's a lot of cattle as well. So I think it is always interesting to go for a drive and to see that firsthand. So you just start up in Auckland in the north and drive all the way down south? Yeah, well, there's many ways you can do it, but um, I recommend one way of doing it is to arrive in Auckland and to um, have an experience of a big city, well, a big city for New Zealand, and then drive down the centre of the North Island and maybe have a f uh, farming experience somewhere. Um, there's a lot of farm stay opportunities available for tourists who come to New Zealand, so depending on how you do it, you might want to stay two or three days with a family and experience a farming lifestyle. Um, so that's, yeah, one thing I'd recommend. Um, and another is to um, maybe go to a city like Rotorua, which is uh, really in the centre of the North Island and experience um, Māori culture. Um, there's a Māori village there uh, near the Whakarewarewa forest which hosts um, a lot of tourists and you get to experience Māori waiata which is uh, Māori songs um, and you get to see um, the hot springs in New Zealand and thermal mud pools. Um, so yeah, Rotorua is... Um, a nice city to go and visit and um, then work your way down to the capital of New Zealand which is Wellington and I think if you want to experience the cafe lifestyle of New Zealand that's a good place to go. So Monica a minute ago we were talking about Tai Chi and about how it helps longevity helps you live a long life. Um, one time when I was in Bangkok I met a guy and he was doing Tai Chi and he looked really young, but he said the secret to his old life, he said the secret to looking young was Tai Chi and cold showers. He took a cold shower every morning. Could oh, you, wow. Could you do that? Ah, uh, no, I don't think I could actually. Yeah, you know, I actually tried it for a while. I tried it for about a week and I did feel so energized and it was easy in Bangkok because so it's really warm, but I, I couldn't keep it up, especially now that I'm in the cold climate. There's no way. Yeah, I remember when I was young, my mother used to teach me to um, splash my face with cold water in the morning um, because she believed that helped wake you up 
And I remember as a child not liking that at all because I just found it too cold. So I preferred to splash my face with warm water. So have you heard of any other secrets to having a long life? Um, Yeah, I've heard of uh, quite a few different secrets to having a long life. Um, I guess one secret that a lot of different cultural groups seem to share is uh, diet. If you take the Japanese as an example, um, and Japanese people do have um, a long life expectancy in comparison to other people from other countries. Um, I think the Japanese eat a diet that's quite low in fat and reasonably low in salt as well. And I think their fluid intake is quite healthy. Um, because they drink a lot of green tea, which has antioxidants in it, and they drink a lot of miso soup, which has a lot of vegetables in it and is made from fermented barley. So I think that's very healthy. I've also heard that people in the Mediterranean, they also often have a, a long lifespan in certain regions, and maybe the combination of wine, just a little wine, not too much, but wine and olive oil, and then a lot of uh, fish, seafood, is also maybe beneficial to a long life. Yeah, that's true. I've heard um, French people, for example, live a long life, and that has often been said due to a glass of red wine a day. And... um, I know people think differently about alcohol and its effect on the body um, these days. Right. Yeah, because alcohol used to be considered quite a bad thing um, and discouraged in all forms, but now people tend to think that a glass a day is actually quite beneficial to to your health. I've, I've also actually heard that laughter that people that laugh a lot tend to live longer. Oh, yeah, I've heard that too, actually, because um, laughing releases natural endorphins, and I think that helps you physiologically, and also I think psychologically you're happier if you're laughing. So, yeah, I think um, that long life is related to um, how you're feeling, and I think um, a lot of it's psychological um, as well as... um, Physical, for example, how much you're eating and what types of food you're eating. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of in the same boat, but I just don't know if I laugh that much. (laughs) Maybe I'm in trouble. (laughs) So, Monica, you do Tai Chi. Ah, Yes, I've just joined the Tai Chi club. What made you join the Tai Chi club? Well, I wanted to do something that was a lot different to what I usually do, which is high-impact sports like basketball and tennis. So you wanted to do something that was slower? Yeah, well, I don't usually um, enjoy exercise that is quite slow, um, such as yoga. But I decided to join this club, and I'm really enjoying it. So what exactly is Tai Chi? What, What do you do in Tai Chi? Well... There are different types of Tai Chi. Um, There's the original Tai Chi, which involves quite quick, fast movements. And then there's a slower form of Tai Chi, um, which is quite popular in Japan. I think it's called Mr. Young Tai Chi. And that involves very slow, um, pronounced movements. And that's the Tai Chi that I'm doing. Um, how do you feel like after you do Tai Chi? Do you feel tired? Do you feel energetic? Um, after I've done Tai Chi, I feel quite energetic, actually. Um, I don't really feel tired because I haven't had a really hard workout. But I feel that um, my mind is very relaxed and very focused and I'm very um, motivated to do whatever I need to do for the rest of the day. Now, uh, you actually are a tennis coach, so you teach sports. Would you recommend Tai Chi for other athletes? 
Yeah, I do recommend Tai Chi for other athletes. It's quite difficult to know exactly how you would benefit from Tai Chi and how it can directly relate to a specific sport. But I th- I've heard that it works on your energy levels um, and focuses your mind so that everything's in balance. And I think that can help any kind of sport because um, even in a sport like tennis, um, it's important to have balance when you're hitting the ball, when you're um, volleying, when you're getting ready for a smash. It actually involves um, having balance in terms of where your centre of gravity is. So, yeah, the concepts are similar. Hey, George, actually, it's really, Mm. yeah, it's funny that you mentioned relationships because I'm actually having a problem with Joe. Is that the guy with the curly hair? Yeah, that guy. He's really nice and everything, Mm -hmm. but, like, I really don't think it's working out. Why? What's wrong? Well, he's really narrow-minded, and I'm really different. We just, he's nice and everything. He's Mm -hmm. kind and sweet, and... It's just not for me. Like, we're totally oh, different people. I see. Yeah. So what are you going to do? I think I have to rip the Band-Aid. And I th- I think I'm just going to send him an email or something. An email? Yeah. But you've been dating for a while now. and You, you like him, right? Yeah, like, we're so sweet together. But it's just, I, mean, I it... don't see a future. But isn't an email just a little too cold and... Uh, yeah. He might tell other people about it. I mean, rumors spreading and whatnot. Ah, uh huh. Okay, then what do you what do you think I should do? How should I do it? Well, you should probably just you know meet him face to face and. Oh, face to face. Okay, what? Where? Where should I meet him? Like, do you think I should just invite him over to my place? Nah, you should probably do it in public where. You know. Oh, good, 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 good. I think that's. I don't know. Maybe a, that cafe. (laughs) Oh, that cafe. Yeah. Well, while I'm having my date, you could be breaking (laughs) up with your boyfriend. It'll be great. (laughs) You're so mean. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. That was uncalled for. I I don't know what to say. What What do you think would hurt him less? I I gotta say, honesty would be the best policy. Honesty? Um, okay, so Mm -hmm. this is what I'm gonna say. Joel, you're great, Mm -hmm. but we're not meant to be. How's that? Yeah, it's it's great, it's great. Okay, so, okay, okay, I'm done. I think, I think I'll meet him at the cafe, and okay, things, things will work from then. I'll, I'll improvise. Great. <laughs> hey, Crystal, I need some advice here. What's up, George? So, there's this, like, red-headed girl in class, and I kind of got a crush on her, but... Mm. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I don't know, you know, how to ask her out. I don't, I don't even know if she knows my name, but, yeah. Oh, come you on. You got any advice? Um... I would personally just be natural and just go straight forward. Go straight forward and... And ask her out. How I do that? Mm, I don't know. For my personal advice, I think you should just go straight forward and say, Hi, my name is George and Mm -hmm. give her an appearance. Hold on, I'm going to write this down. Okay. 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 And next step is if you are free, no, you always have to check if she's either married or if she's a lesbian mm-hmm. or if she is single. Okay. So number three is what you're looking for. Okay, number three. Mm. So if she's single, just say, hey, how about we go out for a cup of coffee or something? Mm-hmm. And, coffee. And yeah, that's how you get her. <laughs> So yeah, what, what if she doesn't like coffee though? I mean, what what, what else could we do on a date? Mm-hmm. Uh, assuming she will say yes. I'll do 
Yeah, well, what's fun to do on a date anyway? Fun to do on a date is just the fact that you're being with her and just try to get her to know her more. Wait, 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 wait one sec. Do I need to pay for this or? <laughs> um, I don't think you should pay on the first date. I, I think sometimes that can be offensive to women. Oh, that's great because I'm totally broke. <laughs> I think you should just ask her casually, not like a date date. Just say, hey, I would like to know you a little bit more and just go out for a small little drink. Like, go to that new cafe that's open. Like, mm -hmm. like a lot of girls think that place is so cute. I think you should take her there. But I think cafes are boring. Cafes are boring. Men! <laughs> Women don't think so. Oh. This is the point. Okay. Write it down. All right. Um, so we're talking about going local as we're in a different country. How much of the local culture do you absorb? How much like local... Because we both live in Japan, right? Yes. How much in percentage, for example? How much Japanese food would you say you eat? Oh, I would say like probably 80% of my food is Japanese food. Yeah. I, I like it because um, most of it is healthy and it's actually what I can get in the cafeteria at mm. work. So, yeah. It's convenient. It's convenient. What about you? Well, I mostly make my own food mm -hmm. and... Japanese food is really difficult to make, I think. I'm I'm really challenged when it comes to cooking anyway. I'm really bad at cooking. And to have to try and learn a new style of cooking is just too much for me. I'm really lazy. So I would probably say if I'm cooking food myself, I never cook Japanese food. Zero percent of the time. I never. But if I go to a restaurant, then... I'm sure I can eat some Japanese food sometimes. I sometimes watch the TV and learn how to cook um, Japanese food. There mm. are some easy recipes. Um, do you ever watch the Japanese uh, television? Uh, I tons try. Of... But, yeah, like you said, it's a lot of cooking programs. There's a lot of... That was uh, what I was about to say. Yeah. Tons of cooking TV shows programs. Yeah, and I watch oh. cooking programs and I just get angry that I can't cook. I can't do it like that, so I just get frustrated, so I stop watching. Oh, yeah. yeah. What about other kinds of shows? So, like, not just cooking shows? Mm, well, they have, I guess, they have pretty funny shows, but I don't understand <laughs> what they're saying, but I try to follow them, and, yeah, sometimes they're very interesting. Uh, they also talk about um, clothing season, was trending in Japan, mm. what... Um, young people are doing they have some interviews sometimes very yeah. interesting interviews and they're always teaching you something so it's something that i like about japanese tv you're always learning something yeah. from other countries as well that's true mm -hmm. uh so how about like your friendship circles how much how much percentage of your friends would you say are japanese versus international oh i would say probably um, 40 percent are japanese mm. yeah the rest of them are international people because i work with international people so i spend most of the time with them mm. and yeah. when you're with your japanese friends do you speak mostly in english or mostly in japanese oh i would say like probably 70 percent japanese and the rest would be english because um, normally when they know a second language is english not spanish mm. So I like 0% Spanish oh, wow. with Japanese. But um, yeah, like I would say 70% of the conversation is in Japanese also because I want to practice my Japanese. Right. Yeah. What about you? Um, well, I'd say out of my friends, mm -hmm. recently I've had like no time to socialize. So probably about 30% of my friends are Japanese. But when I speak with them, it's mostly in Japanese. I don't like speaking in English. Oh, it's just like probably for the same reasons as you like i want to practice my japanese but i will say that from my japanese friends like most of them probably like 80 percent of them always want to speak in english right? because they want to practice yeah. english too so it's like a give and take like we speak a little bit in japanese but Sometimes we speak more in English. Yeah. It depends also the topic and what you're talking about. If yeah. it's a topic you can talk about, then yeah, go for it in Japanese. But yes. if it's a difficult topic. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
So, Gilder, we're both teachers yes. and we both live and work abroad, right, yes. from our home countries. Um, I'm from Scotland and you're from Venezuela. So I'm sure we both have to deal with homesickness because we're so far from our home. Uh, how do you deal with homesickness? Oh, it's very difficult mm -hmm. because, as you said, I'm so far from my country. Yeah. And like special seasons like Christmas or during the Holy Week is something that we celebrate okay. a lot. Uh -huh. um, I feel really homesick, especially because of the food we yeah. have. Yeah. Uh, particular food and and also meeting with your friends uh, hanging out with them mm -hmm. going to the beach so all those things that I don't have here mm -hmm. is, is yeah it really makes me feel homesick but um one thing I do is I always try to go f for things in the country where I'm living mm -hmm. so what what do what do the the locals do is there any interesting and it's it's a sort of like an adventure because you're mm -hmm. doing something new so you're kind of replacing something that you're used to do yeah by something new so in a way is it's nice dealing with homesickness yeah. yeah what about you well that's kind of what i was going to say um you said replacing i was going to say just distract yourself mm -hmm. with uh, other activities obviously we've met new people living here and you know i've made some new and wonderful friends and um it's not the same as your life back home but it's uh it's a good distraction i think um you mentioned activities so yeah just exploring the new culture that we're in and you know if feeling homesickness um in regards to food you know there's there's a lot of delicious food here um here in japan delicious food so we can distract our our needs i guess yeah that's one of the good things of being in Japan is the fact that you get to know people from all over the world yeah. and, and try so many different things. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a it's a distraction. Mm -hmm. It's a good distraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, one, I guess, one strategy I have as well for homesickness is whenever someone um, comes to visit, uh, which is very rare, but it does happen. I I send them a list of things that they can fill their suitcase with to bring over for me. Uh -huh. um, foods from home yes. and uh, just tea bags from the local su supermarket and, uh, you know, some cosmetics or toiletries that I cannot buy here, particular brands that I like. And um, it's little things like that that, I, that help me, I think, deal with not having them <laughs> basically having them that helps me deal with not having them <laughs> i also do that mm -hmm. sometimes like um I, my family tried to visit me once a year mm -hmm. so their suitcase packed of stuff from venezuela mm -hmm. uh, which is very um important for me uh -huh. and also i try to find those um supermarkets from south america like brazilian supermarkets right yeah or sometimes the filipino supermarkets they have stuff that we have yes. in venezuela yes so, yeah it's it's very nice uh, i actually used to live up in a different part of japan where there was quite a large brazilian population mm -hmm. and there were many um like a brazilian convenience store yes um oh. wonderful bread <laughs> the meat was good too yeah, yeah lots of really good products so i guess a shop like that would would help you in particular yes i guess brazilians they don't have the same issue that we have with homesickness because they they can get a lot of stuff from brazil here That's in japan true. Yeah. yeah well of course you know there are international stores around i'm lucky enough to even in a small city like this i have a an international store that's reasonably close so there are a few products that you can i feel happy about i guess maybe i wouldn't even buy them at home but when i see them in the shop here i feel like oh i can't get yeah. other things so i'm <laughs> going to buy these biscuits or... why something that you can read <laughs> yeah well yeah that's true just peel the peel the language sticker off the top and read the, the yes. english below <laughs> yeah there are different ways to cope with it i think yes so do you think that we should send people to mars or the moon to spend all this money on space travel? Well, I think we should. Um, space travel can give people hope for the future. And space travel can unite people from different countries for a common goal. Mm. But 
Do any countries work together to travel in space? Oh, certainly. The International Space Station、mm -hmm. has astronauts from different countries working together.、Um, and I think that a joint effort is the best way to do space missions. I think that we could go back to the moon and learn much more. By going there, then we can learn if we don't go there. I see what you mean, but I think we could learn more and we could improve more if we can help the people on Earth. Think of everything we could learn from the children that can't get an education these days. Maybe the next Einstein. Is a poor little girl who doesn't have the money to go to school. If we spent more money on school and clean water and vaccines, maybe we could learn more from ourselves than from going to space and going to Mars. I I agree with you that more money should be spent on education, but we don't need the next Einstein if we're not doing space travel. <laughs> <laughs> um, the problem is, what are people with money willing to spend it on? I think that it would be nice if we could have all the rich countries spend money on education for poor people. But if you look at the numbers, the cost of one space mission. Is much cheaper than the things we spend money on now. Like what? Well, the first example that comes to mind is war.、Mm -hmm. One day of war is so expensive for all the governments and militaries that are involved. One day of war costs more money than one space mission. But yeah, war goes on and on for days. Yeah, and years. So if you think about the money in terms of,、um, sorry, so the money for a space mission seems expensive by itself, but when you compare it to other things, it's actually kind of cheap. I see what you're saying. You're comparing the cost of space travel to war, but I would compare the cost of space travel to the cost of, for example, getting rid of malaria. I think we could get rid of a terrible disease like malaria for as much as we would spend on a trip to Mars. Hmm. Getting rid of malaria or going to Mars? Well, of course, I would also choose that we should get rid of malaria. Maybe we'll have to agree to disagree. We might have to disagree this time. Okay. We've been hearing a lot about Mars in the news. Yeah, NASA keeps coming out with announcements every year. We just found out that there was there's water on Mars, liquid water. Yes, recently they revealed that there's evidence of liquid water. That's crazy. Mhm.、Mm、Last year they announced that they definitely found ice,、mm -hmm. solid water, in the soil. Mhm.、Mm、in the soil on Mars surface, they found frozen water. Now they found evidence of liquid water flowing. Wow. Do you think? Do you think people can go to Mars? Do you think we should send people to Mars? I definitely think we can go there. We've already sent a number of spacecraft to Mars, starting with satellites many decades ago. Then there were landers, where a satellite landed on the surface and. Sent data back to Earth. Then we sent the rovers 
little robot cars that drive around on Mars. So we've already successfully sent many missions to Mars. I'm sure we could do one with humans. But none of the satellites or landers or rovers, they've never come back. Do you think we could send people and they'd come back safely? Well, that is a problem. We could definitely send people to Mars, but bringing them back, having the astronauts come back to Earth would be a much more difficult problem to solve. So you think maybe we would send astronauts to Mars and they would never come back safely? Well, if you think about the old explorers mm -hmm. in the olden days, explorers used to leave their home and find new regions and not plan to go back. Yeah. People used to take a risk that maybe they couldn't return. So I think there are people there are people who are willing to go on a one-way trip to Mars. I'm sure there are people willing to do that. But are the rest of the people willing to send someone on that mission? Mm, I think people would, some people will say yes, and some people will say no. I don't know what the percent would be, but... What I'm I'm willing to allow someone to do that. If someone says, I want to go to Mars, I know it's a one-way trip, but I want to go. I think that's okay. We how, should let them go. How about you? Would you volunteer to go? Oh, no, not me. <laughs> I'm staying here on Earth. Okay. So what are three foods that you can't stand? Three foods that you hate? Uh, number one would be chocolate. Chocolate? Yes. That's crazy. I don't like the, the feeling that you have when you put a piece of chocolate inside your mouth. It's like too hot. Like if I eat a piece of chocolate, I need to drink a lot of water. I, it wow. feels... It, I don't like it. Yeah. I, I will gladly eat all of your <laughs> chocolate. If you have chocolate you don't want, yeah. I'm here. It's, it's weird because when... You know, chocolate is very popular as a gift. Somebody's always giving you chocolate, and I, I take it because I don't want to say everybody, like, I hate chocolate, mm -hmm. actually. But, yeah. What about you? What's something you don't really like? Well, I have something I don't like that I think is really popular. And every time I say I don't like it, I always get the same, like, what kind of reaction. But I don't like ice cream. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't like ice cream. I don't think food should be that cold. Mm. I don't like it. Food shouldn't be too cold to eat it's really just not you don't know what you're missing i'm ice creams are really really good especially in summer chocolate's really good chocolate i'll take chocolate <laughs> over ice cream any day well you can try um chocolate ice cream oh chocolate ice cream is the worst chocolate <laughs> ice cream is the worst Ugh, no, what about you. a second one do you have any second food that you don't like i don't like tomatoes oh which is strange because i eat lots of pasta with tomato flavored stuff in it but just tomatoes by themselves mm -hmm. is not something I enjoy. Whenever I have like a hamburger with a tomato in it, I always have to take it out yeah. and give it to someone else. Just, I don't like it. It's just juicy and not a good juicy way. Mm -hmm. I don't like yeah. garlic. You don't yeah. like garlic? I like garlic in food, but I don't like to um, see it or eat it um, mm. and have this the, the taste of garlic. I don't like it. Once so, you've got the taste of garlic, you don't get rid of that for about three days. Right? Exactly. That's another thing. Yeah. So when my mom is cooking and using garlic, she, after that, she had to remove it. She cannot leave any evidence that she was using garlic <laughs> in her food. Yes. Uh, is there another food that you don't like? Mm, mm, I would say um, a sprouts, a Brussels sprouts. Man, no one likes yes, sprouts. Yes. Bitter, and even though some people say it's good for your body, I don't like them. Mm. I think, yeah, sprouts are just universally hated. No one likes sprouts. Yeah, well, but when you are a child, your parents, for some reason, are always giving you yeah. that. Yeah. 
yeah cruel oh, I, I don't like it it looks like i feel like like a cow eating those things yeah <laughs> yeah i can imagine it's just ugh. what about you any other i have one more but it's really strange i've never actually eaten them but looking at them makes me really uncomfortable and that's olives I hate oh, olives. I can't I stand <laughs> olives. Just looking at them makes me want to scream. Really? Like, I think it's the hole. Mm -hmm. I don't like the hole in olives. I'm like scared of olives. It's really strange, but I no. I like them. Very you can have my olives. Green, black. <laughs> oh, no. If I see them in a jar at Better the supermarket, just no. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't like them. <laughs> scared of olives. It's the craziest thing ever, but no. Don't like olives. Keep them away from me. Ugh. Good. <laughs>So what are three foods that you absolutely have to have that you can't live without? Mm, I would say that I couldn't live without arepa. It's, it's like my daily breakfast in Venezuela. What's arepa that? is is made of corn flour and um, it, it looks like a hamburger. So you put anything you want inside and it's very tasty. And I would say like 95% of Venezuelans eat arepas every day. Um, well, it's, it's, it's kind of like a high carb diet in my country. So I need rice also mm -hmm. for lunch and bread. Bread is another thing in, in the afternoon, a piece of uh, bread, uh, sweet bread with coffee is kind of like a mandatory. <laughs> so lots and lots of carbs in your yes. diet. What about you? What about in England? Uh, well, English breakfast is not the healthiest of breakfasts. It's um like a big, big plate with fried eggs, fried sausages, hash browns, like hash potatoes, um, beans, just oh, everything fried and everything delicious. And I would say that I can't live without that. But if I ate it every day, then I would probably not be able to leave my house because I would be so, so fat. But it's definitely a food that is in my top foods of all time that's probably my favorite but recently i've been eating lots of tofu as oh, breakfast yeah so a little bit of tofu a little bit of soy sauce just, just for breakfast that. which is just it's a bit of a boring breakfast but it's really healthy i guess mm -hmm. so i've been eating that a lot every day so i probably can't live without that recently and also pizza Pizza. Oh, pizza, yes. Pizza. I think Very everyone good. can't live without pizza. Yes. Pizza is the best. Pizza is definitely a yeah, food I that I can't to live without. Yeah, I try to have pizza probably mm, tw once a week, I would say. Yeah. What's your favorite it's... topping? Ah, that would be cheese. Cheese, classic. Definitely. Bacon. <laughs> cheese and bacon. Oh, that sounds yes. good. Yes. Very, very tasty. Just yeah. cheese and bacon or anything else? No, no. Um, uh, I'm going for anything actually, but I will always need to have cheese and bacon on my pizza. Pizza's yes. not pizza without cheese. Yes. It yes. has to have cheese. Now, what else do you have? So you said tofu, pizza. Mm -hmm. What other food can you leave without? Well, my grandma is part Italian. Mm -hmm. So we have lots of like pasta and lasagna oh, in our family. Good. So I try and eat, well, I try not to eat a lot of pasta because I'll get really fat. But pasta is definitely something that I can't live without. Yeah, Italian so food is so good. Yeah. yeah, and again, lots of cheese. Yeah, we we also do a lot of uh, lasagna. Mm. But, well, we call it pasticcio. Pasticcio. It's a different name, but it's the same lasagna, and it's also very tasty. So yeah. good. But so like a real food. like real comfort food, isn't it? Lasagna. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, so good. So, uh, what would you say is your comfort food? My comfort food, hmm, that would be arepa again. Mm. Yeah, definitely. You said you can have lots of like fillings in that. Yes. Um. So my favorite would be um black beans with cheese, cheese. inside. It sounds a little bit like a mix up of things, but it's it's really really tasty. We do eat a lot of black beans every day mm. in in Venezuela. Yeah. Mm. It's very common. What about you? Mm, my comfort food, I can't eat it as much as I would like to these days, but it's probably my mom's spaghetti bolognese. So good. It's so good. Like lots of pasta, lots of tomato, lots of herbs, lots of cheese. 
Sounds good. Ah, oh, it's amazing. I would like live with my parents if it meant I could have spaghetti bolognese every day. So good, so tasty. Ah, oh, but yeah, it's the best. Nice. Hey, Katie, I'm having a party, a uh, Super Bowl party at my house on Sunday in a couple weeks. Would you like to come over? Um, okay, but I have absolutely no idea what the Super Bowl is. Well, you know, the Super Bowl is our big sporting event, and we have it um, once a year. But it's okay if you don't know anything about American football, because actually the Super Bowl is kind of like our unofficial holiday. Okay. Yeah, so what happens is, is everybody comes over to somebody's house, and you have a big party and you watch the game, but nobody really watches the game. There's okay. lots of other stuff going on, so it should be good. Do you have like Super Bowl food? That exactly, eat? exactly. So it's kind of like a big feast. So we'll have, um, you know, like hamburgers and stuff that we'll barbecue and we'll have lots of like chips and dip and stuff like that. So you don't have to bring any food, but it's potluck. So if you do want to bring something, um, yeah, I, I would recommend it. Do you have to be like a supporter of one of the teams in the final? No, and actually the game's not for a couple of weeks, so we don't know who the two final teams are going to be. Right. They still have to decide, but um, actually there's a bunch of things that have nothing to do with football on the Super Bowl that you'll probably like. Um, the first is they have the halftime show. You may have heard about the Super Bowl halftime show. Okay. You like music, right? I love music. Right, so they always have a really big musical act. Um, and actually this year, I don't remember who it is. I'll have to check, but it's usually somebody like Bruno Mars or U2 or somebody like that. I think last year it was Katy Perry, was it not? It might have been, yeah. But it's always a really, really big person. Mm. Um, another thing that's really cool about the Super Bowl is the commercials. Okay. So the commercials, you know, the company spent a lot of money on the commercials, and they're usually really good. So the commercials, people are often more into the commercials than the game. Okay. Especially if one team is kind of, if it's a lopsided win. So yeah, so the commercials are fun. What kind of commercials do they have? Oh, you know, like companies like Pepsi or Coke or like really big name companies. It's like really big ones. Yeah, they'll spend like millions and millions of dollars. These are usually the most expensive commercials uh, because it's one local game and one local audience. Like the World Cup is a more watched event, but the commercials are regional for all the different countries. Whereas the Super Bowl, the commercials are just for Americans. Yeah. So, yeah, these are usually the most expensive commercials like around the world. So they're usually really well done. Is it just American teams in the Super Bowl? Yes, it's very, um, you know, Americanizing, you might say. Um, but, you know, like I said, the game's really not that important. But there is one way that you can make money. Okay, I'm yeah. interested. So what happens is we have, like, a pool, and you can draw numbers. And, like, you don't have to know anything about football. But you can have, like, you know, draw numbers for the first person to score a touchdown or the first player to get a penalty or things like that. And you just fill out the chart. And then if your player gets that, then you can get money. So you have to contribute. You have to pay like 10 bucks mm. to play, but then it's in a pool and then you could win money at different points during the game. Have you ever won at the Super Bowl before? Yeah, it's kind of like how it works out where everybody wins a little money and everybody loses a little money. Mm. So, you know, gambling technically is illegal, <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah, but it's like just one of those things that everybody it's does. It's not for big money. No. Just for a little bit of money. Just a little bit of money. So it's just, okay. Just to have fun. Mm. Yeah. So, um, uh, and then I'll, once I find out what teams are in the finals, then I'll tell you about the colors. And it's usually best that you choose one team that you're going to support. Okay. So I'll fill you in about who the teams are later and all right. that. Right. So are you willing to come? Yeah, sounds like fun. Okay, cool. I'm in. All right, so it's going to be at my house at 3, so if you can show up around 2-ish. Should I bring some food? You can, like you can bring some type of maybe salad or um, like a bean dish or something like that if you like. But we'll, like the main food we'll provide. We'll have pizza, we'll have burgers. Oh, and it's BYOB. Okay. So if you want to drink, you have to bring your own alcohol. All right. But we'll, we will have some beers and stuff. Do you drink? Uh, sometimes. Okay, cool. Like 10% of the time. All right, so <laughs> see you there. Glad you can come. No worries. So... So we've been talking about women's roles in society, and are you a stay-at-home mom or a working mom? Well, I guess I'm both. Um, right now, I'm on maternity leave, and I'm on month six of maternity leave. What does that mean? So maternity leave is when you have a job, but then you become pregnant, or you're going to have a baby, maybe adopt too, 
So you're going to have a baby, and so you take time off of work to stay home with the new baby. Oh, I see. Do you still get paid? I do. I get about half of my wage. So I do still get paid, and I'm very grateful for that. So I've been at home with the new baby for six months, and I'm going to go back to work next month. Oh, what will happen with the baby? So I have two kids, actually. I have a toddler and a baby. And both of them will go to daycare during the day. I see. So I signed up for the daycare before the baby was even born. It's really hard to find good daycare that you can afford, that's near your house. So you have to start planning before the baby's even born if you're the type of person who wants to go back to work. I see. I don't think many men worry about getting good daycare for their children when no. they think about their jobs. No. Even when there's a family and the mother and father both work, still it's the mother that has to do everything with the kids, usually. Usually the mom has to, for example, get the bag ready for the kids to take to daycare. They have to arrange the daycare. They have, the daycare has the mother's phone number, usually. And so the mom has to do a lot of extra work even though mom and dad both have full-time jobs. I see. Are you saying that things should be different? Yes, I think things should be different. I'm so lucky. My husband agrees with me. And my husband, he drops the kids off at daycare and he picks them up and he does the laundry and the dishes. And it helps me to be... And it helps me focus on my career so that I can stay late at work if I need to. I can go to an extra meeting on a weekend. And it makes me feel more fulfilled that it's not my husband's job that comes first. A lot of times women make less money than men and they put their job second to their husband and... It's not equal, and it's not fair. And so I think that people should work on making things more equal. Well, I agree with you. Thank you. Okay, so Sarah, you said you participated in rodeos before, but I thought only men ride horses in rodeos. Yeah, like 99.9% .9 of the time the men do all of the rodeo sports. There's like two sports for women and the rest of them are all for men. Oh. When I said I wanted to do the traditionally male events, they said, you can't do that. You're a woman. You have to do these other events that are not dangerous, they're safe. For example, the men do calf roping. You work with a baby cow, a calf that's about 100 pounds. The women do goat roping. Oh. And they work with a tiny goat that's about the size of a small dog. So I just always thought the difference was stupid. I don't want to do the easy, safe event. I want to do the difficult event. And people were really surprised and first they said you can't and I said I'm going to anyways wow. and the first time I did the saddle bronc they said look 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 we got you a girl horse because you're a girl oh my and I thought well you didn't need to draw more attention to it I just want to compete like everyone else right and my first time, I fell off the horse and I was really injured. And I was laying there and one of my friends came running out. And he said, I thought he was going to help me up and help me leave because I was really hurt. And instead he said, hurry up, you got to get off the 
you got to get out of the arena because the next person wants to go. Oh, wow. And I was really happy that he said that, actually, because he was just treating me the way he treated any other competitor. Oh, get up, be tough, you're fine. Yeah. And I didn't want anyone to so help he me. So he didn't help you. Right. And I, I was really glad that he was treating me like everyone else. And when you see a rodeo, you'll see that the women do events where they can dress really nice. They always wear nice clothes, beautiful hat. They even have earrings and things on. And when the men do events, they're doing the events that they really have to use their muscles and get dirty. And I really liked doing those instead. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying I liked to do the other one. And I think that maybe other women like to do the other events too. So do you think is the situation is improving? Are more girls joining rodeo now? I don't think so. I think the sport of rodeo is becoming less popular. Oh. So I think in the future, there won't be more women in rodeo. There will just be fewer people in rodeo. Oh, I see. Because the the rodeo events, they're not very kind to the cows or the other animals and as people get older maybe they get more soft-hearted like me and they don't want to make the animals get tied up or chase the animals and mm. so I think fewer people are interested in rodeo these days so Sarah you talked about competing in a rodeo have you done any other sports on horseback yeah. Well, not a sport. I used to have a job, and my job was to take people on horseback into the mountains in Wyoming. And it was a really fun job. Every day, we would saddle up maybe 15 or 20 horses, and then we would take beginners, people who had never ridden horses before, and we'd show them how to lead the horses and get on the horses and then we'd go up into the mountains for two hours or four hours or sometimes all day well, that sounds great yeah that was your job that was my job and it was really fun we would walk along these cliffs and people would get nervous and they'd say oh no isn't my horse gonna fall down the cliff and I'd say, no, your horse doesn't want to fall down the cliff, just like you. <laughs> yeah, right. And the horses were really good. And to be honest, the horses mostly ignored the people on their backs. The really? horses, they knew the path that we were taking. Oh. And sometimes people would want to do something that's dangerous, like go too fast or go a different way, yeah. and the horses would ignore the people and go the way they're supposed to. Oh, that's probably better. Yeah. What about wild animals? You're going on horseback trail rides through the mountains, right? Yeah, and the area we went through was famous for elk. We saw lots of elk, and... You know, where there's elk, there are also the animals that eat elk. So there were mountain lions and bears. Bears. I never saw a bear, but I always told the people I was with, I said, don't worry, guys, if you see a bear, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than the slowest horse. <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Did the did the visitors like that joke? They did. They thought it was really funny until I pointed out which horse was the slowest. And then that person got really nervous. <laughs> Can you ask what about mountain lions? Did you, see mountain lions? did you ever see a mountain lion? I never saw a mountain lion, but one time the horses were all acting really nervous and they wouldn't go forward. And I didn't know why they were acting this way. Oh. They refused. And so I ended up turning around 
and we went off the trail, and we had to make a big circle. Really? And then later, I found out that there had been a warning that there were mountain lions in the area. And so I think that's why the horses refused to go. Wow, those horses sound pretty smart. Yeah. Sometimes in the morning, when we are the first people on the trail, I would see tracks, like wolf tracks or cougar tracks. But I never saw the real animal. Oh, that's probably lucky. Yeah. Sounds like you had a really fun time at that job. Yeah, it was really fun, and we were outdoors every day. That was my favorite part. The air was so clean, and I loved working with the animals and being in the sunshine. It was great. That's awesome. So, Sarah, I was wondering, what kind of sports do you like to play? Well, I love riding horses. And actually, when I was in college, I took a lot of classes about horseback riding. So I can do all sorts of sports on horseback. Wow, that's amazing. Don't you think riding horses is scary? I think it's part of the fun. For example, I used to be in the rodeo, and I did a sport called saddle bronc riding. And the way you do this is they put the saddle on the horse, and then they let the horse just go crazy and the horse runs and bucks and tries to get you off and you try to stay on and it's really scary but it's also really exciting wow that's that's what's called a bucking bronco right yeah and it's really hard to stay on in fact you win if you can stay on eight seconds oh that doesn't seem very long it's really really long when I was, it's really long when you're on the horse. My first time, I only stayed on about four seconds, and then I fell off in the middle of the ring, and I got knocked out. Oh. Yeah, and the rest, yeah, and I had a big black eye for about two months. Wow, from falling off a horse. That's why it seems scary. Isn't it really dangerous? It is, it is really dangerous, and they don't make you wear helmet or any safety gear. I didn't wear a helmet my first time. I think it was pretty stupid. <laughs> the, you start, so the horse starts in a metal cage, so the horse can't move, and then you sit on top of the horse, on the horse's back in the saddle. And then you say, I'm ready, and they open the door, and the horse explodes and just starts jumping and turning and twisting, and the horse did about three or four jumps, and I fell off. Wow. How many seconds did you make it? Three. Probably three. about three seconds. So you'd have to do that more than twice as long yeah. to win. I got better at it, but I never could stay on for eight seconds. Did you try any other rodeo events? Yeah, I tried to do calf roping. What's that? This is a sport where you have your horse, and your horse is trained. It's not the wild horse from before. And there's a calf, and you try to throw your rope so that you catch the calf. And a calf is a baby baby cow. Wow. And so what do you have to do if you get your rope around the cow? Then you have to run up to the cow and you have to tie the cow's legs together. And when you finish tying the cow's legs together, the timer stops. So you want to do it as fast as you can. That sounds really fun. And it doesn't sound as dangerous as... The saddle bronc competition. No, it's not as dangerous, but after a while, I started to feel bad for the baby cow. I see. It's just, he's a small little baby, 
and he's really scared and he's trying to run away and I I started to feel bad about catching him with the rope and tying him up so I stopped doing it. I see. So when we're talking about ideal hotels, what do you think is an ideal hotel for you? Um, that's a tough question, but when I choose a hotel, I would um, look at where the hotel's located right. and also the food. Right. So as long as the hotel is um, surrounded by nature, um, you know, preferably on the water. Okay. And maybe some mountains in the back. <laughs> and um, if the food, the breakfast and mm, dinner and you know all the food that they have is amazing, I'm good. I'm set. Now, what about facilities? I mean, you know, hotels have various facilities, whether it's gyms or um, movie rooms or computer rooms that allow you to do, you know, internet and various things. Um, you know, some hotels have pools. Would those be things that you would want in your ideal hotel? Oh, yeah. Um, gym, I'm not so interested in because um, I can, you know, play sports outside when I'm surrounded by nature. Why would I be, you know, inside working out? Right. But in terms of swimming pool, I'm actually interested because uh, when I was looking at pictures, um, I don't know which country it was, but there is um, an outdoor pool, like infinity pool, that looked like it was connected to the ocean, and oh, wow. it was just so beautiful. And, you know, before I thought, why would I swim in the in the swimming pool when I have an ocean in front of me? But, you know, if there is a um, swimming pool like that at the hotel, I'll definitely stay there for a long time. Right. Now, what about um, spa facilities, you know, massages and different spa treatments? Is that something that would interest you in your ideal hotel? Oh, yes. Yes, for sure. I am so into massages and, um, yeah, I would definitely want massage room and spas in the hotel. That would be perfect. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, there are some really expensive hotels that offer the service of a personal butler. Do you think that would be necessary for you in your ideal hotel, or would that be um, one amenity that you could do without? I, th mm, I think it depends, but um, I don't really. When I'm um, staying at the hotel, I would usually, you know, want to be alone and want to enjoy my time with my family or my, you know, my husband or myself, that I actually don't want anyone following me everywhere I go. So, you know, to a lot of people might be, you know, that's a good idea. You know, it's a nice treat to have, but I am personally not up for that. Okay, well, sounds like a pretty nice hotel you've just mm -hmm. described. So, Mike, you know, the other day my friends and I were talking about ideal hotels. What is your ideal hotel? Well... There are many hotels that would appeal to me, but I'd say my ideal hotel would, number one, have to have a gorgeous view from the room. And if we're talking about idealistic, um, I would choose a hotel that is suspended over the water, just off the beach. And my ideal hotel would be not a hotel where the rooms are all connected, but rather um, rooms being separate villas or bungalows and those villas to be situated just above the water so when you wake up in the morning you're literally above the water already you're already on the beach and to get from your room to the beach you have to walk out and you wait in the water until you get to the beach so a place like that definitely my ideal hotel would you know something like that um, my ideal hotel would have to be situated in nature and I would really love it to have a location that would provide me with opportunities to do um, a lot of cool activities, you know, perhaps adventure stuff um, in nature, dealing with animals, that type of thing, being able to see the local color of the area. Um, 
so that would probably be my ideal hotel. Um, one other th point I'd like to make is that the hotel would have to have unbelievable food. And I think a hotel with good food, and not just good food, but a lot of options for food. So when you wake up in the morning and you go for a breakfast buffet, you have a choice of virtually any different type of food that there is. Um, a lot of good hotels are, are limited to what kind of food they offer, even if the food is high quality. So that would be another aspect for me that would be quite important for my ideal hotel. Mm, yeah, sounds like a nice hotel that you just described. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hey Todd, I'm going and looking for a gym actually. I hear you're You've joined a gym. Which one? Yeah, actually, there's a real nice gym downtown that just opened um, about maybe a month ago, two months ago. It's really oh, nice. Okay. What's the name of it? Uh, the name is Fitness Club. Ah, yeah. good name. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and uh, it pretty much has everything. I mean, it has, uh, you know, free weights, of course, and it yes. has all the latest machines. Oh, good. Yeah, actually, some of the machines are kind of tricky. I really don't know how they work yet. <laughs> so I have, to, I have to ask the staff. So but it's more than a treadmill. It's a whole big machine that you don't know what to do. Exactly. I'm actually afraid to get on the thing. I don't want to break <laughs> it. You know? Is there people there that can help you? Yeah, actually, um, that's part of the problem is you can't, use any of the equipment unless you get trained for it they're really oh. specific oh, okay. so you have to have guidance it's kind of annoying actually because yeah. you know everything they have a system and they know based on you know your membership what machines you can use and what you can't and yeah oh, okay but what happens if like i've been to a gym before do i still need to get the training before i start yeah that's how i was i told them that i you know had been lifting weights for a while and they yeah. didn't care so you have to get certified to use all the equipment. It's kind uh, of inconvenient. Okay. So do they have classes, though? They do. Actually, they have uh, pretty much everything. They have yoga, kickboxing, spin classes, dancing. So, um, And the, the schedule looks, you know, pretty diverse. Oh, that's good. I do prefer classes than the weights. Yeah. Only one thing that's bad about the classes, though, is that because it's new – and it's a new gym. There's lots of people, and it looks like it's pretty crowded in there. I think oh. you have to reserve what classes you're going to join. Oh, really? Yeah, it's not terrible. Oh, geez. I usually just like to walk in. <laughs> right, right. I yeah, know. when you feel like going to the gym, you go. <laughs> right, right. Hmm. One thing that is nice, though, is they have um, they have a, an actual gym floor, like a basketball gym. So you oh, can play yes. basketball. They have volleyball tournaments. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, if you like more traditional sports... Like tennis, they also yep. have tennis courts. You can do that as well. Oh, that's good. I do like tennis. I love tennis, actually. Mm. Mm. Well, actually, if you're interested, um, I'd be glad to, you know, take you down to the gym and, and show you, you know. Yep. I think you get a free trial workout. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. good. So how much would it cost per month? Well, because it's new, it's kind of expensive. Oh. Um, it costs about $50 a month. Oh, wow. Yeah. But if you buy a membership, a two-year membership, mm -hmm. you can get a two-year membership, I think, for $800. So it's, it saves you some money, so it's yeah. kind of reasonable. And I suppose if you pay for two, two, yeah, you know you have to go then. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's um, $800 for two years, $500 for one year, or $50 a month. Okay. So. Yeah. Oh, one thing that's really cool, too, is they have a social center. They have, like, a, a an area where you can get, like, fruit drinks and coffee and stuff like that and just hang out. <laughs> it's quite nice. That's good. So after after the workout, go and have coffee. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, so, yeah, I'd love to come and have a look at it. Okay, well, uh, next week, anytime, just give me a call. I'll take you there. All right, great. Thanks. Now, you were saying that you worked in radio and at a young age, but then you went back to it much later in life. Can you talk about that? I did. Well, when I was 21 years old, I got headhunted to do a show. This show was basically a freelance show that had to be done in three different languages at the same time. So the range of audience was quite broad. And the, the show was basically anything I wanted, anything I wanted to talk about. So quite often I talked about music, current, event, current events, Anything political, anything non-political, anything that, that came to my mind I would talk about. So what were the three languages of the show? Hindi, Punjabi, and obviously English. Okay, and uh, what was the city? Where was this at? 
This was in Auckland. Okay, so this was one of these kind of blended radio shows where you slip from one language to another? It, it was. Well, the show was catering for everybody, basically. So the criteria was speak in a way that makes people understand, even if they don't speak the language. So the trick was to say one-third in English, the rest in Hindi and Punjabi, where I could, and somehow it just made sense. How do you go about doing that? Like, did you plan it, or does it just kind of roll off the, for roll me, off your tongue? For me, I think it's quite natural because my parents speak in Hindi and Punjabi, and so for me, English is quite natural, and so are the other two languages. Blending them together was never a problem. Now, when you hear languages uh, being switched back and forth like that, are you conscious of it, or sometimes are you not even conscious that you're speaking one language or the other? I don't think I'm conscious of it at all. It just happens. It's a slip of tongue. I, all three languages I'm quite fluent in. So for me, to switch from one to the other is, is just a natural course of a day. So since you have experience in the music industry, what do you think makes a good DJ? A good DJ is one that's neutral when it needs when they need to be, and one who can switch sides very quickly and make things controversial from being neutral. What I mean by that is if you have an interesting topic, and a caller calls you up and is very positive about it, a good DJ would be able to flip it over very quickly and say something that would make it controversial. Now, do you think there's a certain balance, like how much you should talk and how much music should be played? And There is absolutely a balance. Quite often people listen to radio for music, so you need to make sure that your music ratio is more than how much you talk, but the amount you talk has to be interesting, but quite limited. All right, thanks a lot. No, you're welcome. So, Shafani, you were saying that you actually worked in radio from an early age. Can you talk a little bit about that? That's right. Well, I worked on the radio at the age of 12. What basically happened was that I used to call up the radio station quite a lot, answer questions and quizzes and all that sort of stuff. And uh, one of the announcers thought my voice was nice and so wanted me to come and work for him. Without realizing that I was 12 years old, he called me in and had me on. So were you a little scared? I mean, you're only 12. It was very daunting at first. So the first couple of days, I had no idea what was going on. There was a massive microphone in front of my face and I was told to make this show fun and interesting. So yes, it was very daunting. Did you have any prep or did they just stick you in front of the mic and have you react? No, actually there were, there was no prompt. There were no prompts. It was all up to me. I had to come up with stuff on the spot, which was quite easy really because the topics were simple. It was mainly about music. Oh, and that's like, like teen stuff. Yeah, exactly. Or anything that people called up and talked about. It's a very, very childish stuff, but mainly geared at teenagers. Uh, how did your parents feel about it? Very proud of me, obviously. At the age of 12, their daughter was a DJ. Uh, what could be better than that? So they really enjoyed it. I remember they would listen to it every single time, record it, and then listen to it over and over again when they could. Oh, that's fantastic. So uh, were you like a little celebrity at your school? I ended up becoming one. A lot of my friends also did the same recording of my voice on the radio. It, w it was a big thing to be a radio person and being only 12. So my friends thought it was absolutely fantastic and they would take it to school and quite often play it around. So yeah, I ended up getting a celebrity status. So when you were young and you were this DJ, did you envision yourself of being a DJ for a long time? Actually, no, I hadn't. I, I really enjoyed it, had a lot of fun, but it was a hobby. It was never something I wanted to do as, as a profession. So in the future, if you had a, a, a child and they wanted to do this, would you encourage them to do it? I absolutely would, because if they enjoy it, and they enjoy it so much that they want to take it up as a career, why not? With me, it was a hobby. Now, what about podcasts? Like, would you encourage young people to maybe have their own podcast? I think that's a fantastic idea. I think it's really good to be able to express yourself, and through podcasts, they can do exactly that. Hey, Warren. Hey, how's it going? Good. I thought today we could talk about childhood dreams. When you were 10 years old, what did you want to be when you grew up? Right. Uh, well, actually, it's a little embarrassing. I, I wanted to be a truck driver. 
I thought it'd be really neat because you can just travel around everywhere and see different places all the time and you're always on the move. Um, but you know, I, I didn't become a truck driver. No, you didn't become a truck driver. Uh, why, why is that? When did your dream change? Well, probably when I was around 15, I, I thought it would be a lot cooler to be a rock star. Rock star? Yeah, a rock star. I, I really liked uh, electric guitar at the time, and um, a lot of my friends were into music as well. So I, I didn't actually start a band, but uh, I played with a lot of different people, and um, sometimes I would play with some bands, but I never really stuck to it. But I, I did keep playing guitar, and I ended up getting pretty good. What kind of rock star did you want to be? Did you want to be like a heavy metal rock star or a grunge rock star? Uh, well, I guess versatile would be the word. I, I like playing a lot of heavy stuff and uh, maybe uh, maybe some, some folk music as well. So kind of uh, eclectic. So maybe a hippie rock star? Yeah, maybe a hippie. So then when you were 20, did you still want to be a rock star? No, I didn't, but I still played guitar then. I, I actually wanted to be a classical guitarist by then. Okay. what What is classical guitar? Well, it's funny you say that because it's not just classical music. Uh, classical guitar is, um, for one thing, it's a type of guitar. It, it has uh, nylon strings, not the steel strings like you see on a folk guitar. Okay. And there's different styles you can play on it, uh, like Spanish music or flamenco, uh, South American music, some classical music like Beethoven and things like that, or Baroque music like Does it Bach. have a singer with it? Or? Uh, sometimes there are singers. Usually uh, it's solo, uh, but you can play some chamber music with, with other instruments as well. And, uh, yeah, I played some, some pieces with uh, vocalists, but it wouldn't be pop music. And so now you're older. Mm -hmm. uh, are, did your dream come true? Did you become a classical guitarist? I did, uh, but I actually decided to change my dream after I became a classical guitarist. So what's your dream now? Well, my dream now is to become a, a university professor. Oh, and are you making steps to achieve that dream? I am, actually. I'm working at a university now, not as a professor, uh, as, as a part-time lecturer, but uh, I'm taking some courses and studying hard and hoping that my future will, will, uh, will allow me to become a professor. Okay. Well, unless you change your dream again, I bet you'll achieve your dream more. So good luck. Oh, great. Thank you. So, Lindsay, what about your dreams? What What did you want to be when you were 10 years old? Well, when I was 10 years old, I wasn't very realistic, but I knew I wanted to be very powerful. So I thought the dream job would be uh, Wonder Woman. She can fly anywhere. Uh, she has the powers to do good and to help everyone. And she's very uh, badass. So I wanted to be just like her. Unfortunately, wow. it didn't come true, as I'm not Wonder Woman right now. No, I can see that, but it seems like you had a, a good imagination as a kid. But I guess that, that probably changed as you got older. What about when you were 15? Well, then when I was 15, I still wanted to be very powerful um, and very strong, but I had a more realistic idea of what I wanted to be. But I still didn't know a lot about the world, so I just wanted to be a very powerful businesswoman. I had no idea what kind of business, and I had no idea what that actually meant, but I wanted to wear an all-black suit and have a briefcase and go to work in a nice office and drive a nice car and do something that was very powerful. But I had no idea really what a powerful businesswoman does. Oh, well, that seems like a pretty good dream for a 15-year-old. But I guess you probably had a better idea when you were 20, so what about then? So when I was 20, then I still wanted to be powerful and strong. I guess you can see the common theme here. Uh, but then I had even more realistic idea of actual real professions. So at that time, I was quite uh, social. I really enjoyed going to parties. Uh, and I was living in New York at the time. So I thought the perfect job for me would be a public relations specialist. 
uh, I thought I could be one of those people that plans parties or um, does handles the PR, the publicity for celebrities. Uh, I had a dream of maybe working for Madonna or working for a famous TV show and handling all, all their publicity representation. Oh, well, that's great. It seems like you, you had a better idea by the time you were 20. But I guess you probably have some dreams now even. So what kind of dreams do you have now? Well, then uh, when I was 20, I was quite uh, egotistical. I just wanted, only thought about myself and how I could have more money and be more powerful. But then something changed when I started traveling and seeing the world where I decided that I'd rather have a job that does something good for the world and gives back to the community and to the people. Um, so now I'm a teacher and I really enjoy that, the idea of making a difference in, in people's lives. And in the future, maybe when I get older, I hope to start an animal shelter so that um, when animals are left on the street or abandoned, they can come to my shelter and I can provide a happy home for them. Wow, that's a great vision for the future. Thanks. So we're talking about camp today. Uh, did you ever go to camp when you were a kid? I did. I usually went to cub camp, you know, like Boy Scouts. Okay. Was it during the summer? Yeah, it would always be in the summer. And was it for a week or a month? or? I, I can't recall. It probably was about a week. About a week? What would you do at cub camp? Oh, we do different things. Um, one thing I remember is uh, archery. Archery. Yeah, like bows and arrows. So we would have uh, a target, and uh, we, we would practice trying to hit the target, and I was really bad at it. I, <laughs> I remember always, um, it's quite difficult, and I would hurt my, my arm okay. with, with, the, with the bow. Um, but then after the, we were trying to get the target, I remember we did distance as well, and I was actually pretty good at that. I, I figured out how to get a long uh, long shot away, and... I think I, I might be lying, but I think I, I maybe got the longest shot than anyone else. Oh, wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, okay, besides archery, were there other games you played or sports you did? Yeah, well, we would uh, learn how to uh, canoe and uh, we'd, we'd swim and uh, we'd go on hikes. We, we'd learn how to navigate through the forest with a compass. Okay. Things like that. Did you learn how to start fire without matches? We did, yeah. We would uh, use um, two sticks, rub them together, start a fire. Wow. Yeah. Uh, what would you guys do at night? Would you um, play games or have campfires? Yeah, we'd always have a campfire at night. Uh, we'd sing some songs, like kumbaya, and wow. uh, yeah, put on some skits and tell ghost stories. But my favorite thing to do at the campfire was uh, roast marshmallows. Oh, that's the best. Yeah, I'd, I'd spend hours trying to find the perfect stick mm. to, to carve and uh, roast marshmallows on. And sometimes we'd even make the, the chocolate s'mores with the marshmallows. Uh, so that food was good. How was the other food? Um, I don't have any memories of it being good. So I don't think it was very good. We, we would all eat together in, in a, a mess hall much like yourself and uh, actually I remember getting really sick one time and uh, my parents had to come and pick me up and I think I, I got a bit of food poisoning. Oh wow from so, the food yeah. and the scout camp? Yeah, wow right. okay. Um, final question so you were away from your family right? Mm -hmm. Was that hard or easy? Oh it was it was easy I, I remember feeling a little freer and uh, more independent, away from my parents, less rules, less regulations. You weren't homesick at all? I, no, I never did get homesick. Even when my parents came to pick me up that time when I was sick, I, I really didn't want to go home. Oh, too yeah. bad you got food poisoning. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Warren. Lindsay, we're both teachers, and, you know, sometimes our, our students uh, go off to camp over, over the summer break. Did you ever go to camp when you were younger? I did go to camp. The camp I went to was called Pilgrim Pines. Oh, what was that like? Uh, it was great. Uh, it was one week away from my family, and each person got to take care of an animal. Uh, some people took care of horses. Some people took care of sheep. 
but I got the lucky task of taking care of Xanadu the llama. <laughs> what was that like? Oh, it was awesome. I, when I was a kid, my favorite animal was a llama. So um, that's why we looked into this camp to begin with. And uh, I had to brush it, uh, and I had to feed the llama. And it was such a sweet llama that uh, I really fell in love with it. And every day I'd wake up, feed the llama, and brush it. And then uh, in the afternoon, I'd also come and visit the llama. Xanadu was his name. But um, a couple times he got mad. I'm not exactly, I can't remember why actually he was upset. But uh, when llamas are mad, uh, do you know what they do? I don't know. They actually spit. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, and you have to be, and then they get, if they spit at you, that means they're really upset and they can be dangerous. I mean, I was only 10 at the time, so the llama was a lot bigger than me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one time it, it spit at me and the spit got stuck in my hair and it was this really thick, gross, uh, mucusy spit. Oh. Um, and that really uh, struck an image in my mind. I can't ever kind of forget that llama spitting at me. And then after, I think... For a day, I was afraid of the llama, um, and then my counselor, my camp counselor, who was in charge of all the children, had a talk with me and told me how you know sometimes llamas get mad just like people get mad, and mm-hmm. that I need to forgive the llama, and uh, I did. And then the next day, I went and uh, and fed the llama and brushed llama, and everything was back to normal. But it was a really good experience to learn how to take care of a pet. Mm-hmm. Um, and good experience to be away from my family for the first time. Um, so I guess there were other kids at the camp too. Did you guys all eat together? Uh, yeah, we had the like a mess hall they called it, which is basically cafeteria. The food was disgusting. I remember <laughs> losing a lot of weight when I came home, mm-hmm. and my mom would uh, send me packages of chocolate and cookies, and I would eat it all. Uh, but yes, we all ate together. This like gross cafeteria slob food. Uh, like sloppy joe for uh, lunch right. or you know just imagine like turkey and gravy for dinner but the turkey was uh, kind of a blue color or something mm-hmm. everything was just a little bit gross but uh, and at one time we had a food fight and that was absolutely <laughs> amazing this one kid get, got upset the other kid threw some mashed potatoes and the next thing you know turkey's flying mashed potatoes flying everything everyone's getting involved and uh that was really fun Hi, Jake. How are you today? Good. How are you, Shirley? Mm, not too bad, thanks. Um, I thought we might talk about folk heroes today. Sure. And I don't really know much about American folk heroes. Are there sure. any that you have a favorite? or? Well, actually, my hometown in the United States happens to be known as one of the hometowns for Paul Bunyan. Oh, ah, I think I've heard of that name, but I don't know anything about him. Paul Bunyan was a lumberjack. Like, he would cut down trees, okay. and he, he was supposedly a very giant man. He was huge. And I don't know if he actually ever lived in some time in the past, but maybe he was just a very large man, but somehow the stories have been passed down to say that he was as large as a house or as large as a skyscraper, or it completely depends on who you ask. Wow. So not sure whether he's a mythical character or a real character. No one really knows for sure. Hmm. What did he do? Well, um, well, some people say that he took his axe and he dragged it behind his back across the United States and he made the Mississippi River. Ah, so it's a kind of story to explain why something exists. That's part of it. And also, uh, he had a pet, too. His his pet is very famous. And what kind of pet? His pet was an ox, but it wasn't just an ordinary ox. It was a blue ox, and it was also oversized to fit with his size. What did his pet do? Well, his pet, I think, would just carry lumber for him or something. So about when did this story start? I mean, when when did Paul Bunyan become famous, or when did people know about that story? Well, I'm not exactly sure, but like your country, the United States is a very young country and has a very young history since the European settlers came there. So I think it's maybe from a couple hundred years ago, maybe, at the most. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. You've lived in three different parts of the world, so is there any difference between each part in terms Mm. of physical contact? 
Yeah, I have lived in Hong Kong, Guam, and the U.S. Um, Hong Kong is in Asia. Guam is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and the U.S. is American culture. So in Hong Kong, I think most people would not touch each other, just give each other a little bow. I find that a bow is very common in Asia.、Um, if you're very good friends, you wouldn't really hug. Hugging, I think, is a very American thing to do. I think you would just touch each other on the shoulder or give each other a side embrace,、um, a mini hug. In Guam, you would definitely greet your friends and family with a ch-、uh, a kiss on the cheek.、Um, a handshake is much too formal for island culture, because island culture is so relaxed and laid back. You would only do a handshake with business partners or in a really formal setting, but usually a kiss on the cheek is what you receive and give. When you see your family and friends, in the U.S., hugging is most common, I think, for friends and family. But if you're not friends and family, a handshake would probably be the most common.、Mm, is the ha- handshakes always the same, or is there different styles of handshake? Hmm. From what I've observed,、um, Guam has American culture, so Guam handshakes and U.S. handshakes are. The same, I think in Hong Kong it's got a bit a British background, so that's also very similar. I don't see any difference with the handshake.、Hmm. So, what about young people? Is there a different way they interact physically with each other? Yes, definitely.、Um, in Guam, I always see people do a fist bump、um, for close buddies of theirs. Um, girls would definitely hug and give each other a kiss.、Um, in Hong Kong, I don't see the fist bump often. I don't think I've ever seen it at all, actually.、Um, but for close friends, I think a side embrace or a semi embrace would happen. But mostly just some form of touch or acknowledgement of the other person. I think it's also very common for people of the same sex to hold hands in Asia、mm. and just be friends.、Um, women and women hold each other's hands if they are very, very, very good friends, and、uh, it, it's apparently very normal. I don't know about a guy holding another guy's hand, but if a woman and a woman hold each other's hands. It does not signal that they are together as a couple. It might just signal that they are very, very good friends or sisters. In Australia, that would be very strange. <laughs> yes, it would, wouldn't it? Even in America and Guam. So, Nick, let's talk about touching and holding hands and physical touch、uh, with your significant other. Do you and your partner hold hands when you go out in the street?、Hmm. We hold hands all the time. Initially, we,、uh, when we first went out, holding hands was the first thing we did. They have progressively moved on from there to kissing, but holding hands was certainly the first thing we did in our relationship. Do you remember when you first tried to hold her hand, or did she try to hold your hand first?、Hmm. I made the first move. We were sitting on the couch watching a movie, and I was getting a bit nervous, and I couldn't quite、um, couldn't quite concentrate on the movie. So I moved my hand over to hers, and she reciprocated, and and moved on from there. So you know, that's funny that you bring that up because one of the most common moves、um, that is made fun of in movies, as well, is when the guy. Takes a big yawn, a fake yawn, and he opens his arms wide and places it around the girl's shoulder, and thus embraces her. But he had to do it because he yawned. <laughs> my experience, like my first,、um, 
my first hug was like that as well. So it was just a bit of an excuse to us reaching for something and then suddenly my hand went around and she didn't mind. So <laughs> that's it was a very good. Sign. good. <laughs> and what about、mm, kissing? Do、mm. you kiss a lot in public in the streets? Uh, rarely in public because we find it makes other people uncomfortable. Yeah, that's true.、Hmm. I find that when I see couples kissing or making out in public, I usually think to myself, "Why don't you get a room?"、Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to see that. You just want to be having a conversation with them, or yeah, you don't want them to be constantly distracted. So, Shirley, we were talking about childhood memories,、uh, and you're from Scotland. There's anything from your childhood that you can tell us?、Um, I, I know I've got a really funny story, actually. Maybe I was about ten years old or something, and、uh, we used to have this this little kind of shack in the countryside that we were dragged to every weekend, and、uh, away from civilization, you know, and no running water, no electricity. So we kids had to make our own fun. I've got、uh, my brothers, myself, and a couple of cousins. We would always go there at weekends or school holidays or something. And、um, I mean, one of the highlight of our weekends was to go to the Sunday Sunday school, the Sunday morning church service. And the reason, one of the reasons this was、uh, attractive to the kids, was because they bribed us to go there by giving us sweets when we got there. <laughs> so it was great. So we always went anyway. It was a church service for about an hour and singing hymns and stuff like that. Anyway, this one Sunday we arrived early, about half an hour early. There was nobody there. The church wasn't open yet. So it was, as most people know, it rains a lot in Scotland. So on that rainy day, we all were wearing、uh, our cagoules, which is a kind of a rain jacket with a big pocket in the front. And while we were waiting for everybody else to arrive, we started just kind of playing around in the trees. There was a little river nearby, and it was at the time of year when the tadpoles were turning into baby frogs. So we got this crazy idea to. Collect all these. I mean, I'm talking hundreds of frogs were around, so we all got a big handful of baby frogs,、uh, put them in this big pocket of our cagoule, went off into church. So there we are. We're kind of in the middle of the crowd. You know, we weren't at the front or the back. Kind of in the middle, and、uh, everybody's standing up, singing the hymns, and really getting into you know the church singing and stuff like that. And then we decided that we would.、Uh, Get the frogs out. <laughs> so each of us, one at a time, each of us kids, one at a time, kind of crouched down as if we were tying our shoelace, and let all these frogs out of our pockets. So these tiny little frogs started jumping all over the church. And、uh, there's all these ladies in their Sunday best, and started squealing and screaming. And the the minister didn't know what was going on, and he's trying to keep everybody calm. And we're just singing along with the hymn, you know. We are really innocent, and they had no idea because they didn't see us do it, so they had no idea what had happened. And、um, yeah, I mean, we got away with it. We didn't get told off because we didn't get caught. And、uh, yeah, when we after the church service, you know, we had such a laugh after the church service, and yeah, that's one of my my greatest childhood memories, getting up to mischief with my brothers. Monica, you mentioned a farm homestay in New Zealand. Have you ever actually lived on a farm? Um, I haven't lived on a farm as such, but I've visited family friends who have lived on farms. Oh, did you like it? Yeah, I remember loving visiting、um, my family friends on farms. Yeah, especially riding horses. I、oh. loved riding horses when I was young. So, are you、uh, good? Are you an equestrian professional? Um, I wouldn't say that. I do remember one time,、um, my mother. Always seems to tell people this story about when I was young,、um, and we were at her friend's farm. I was on a horse, and、uh, the horse took off, and I was only about, I think, ten at the time, and I was hanging off the side of this、oh. horse, and my mother was really worried for me. Yeah. And then, when the horse finally stopped, she、um, 
you know, she came running up and asked me if I was okay and things. And apparently I said to her, oh, it's okay. I wanted it to go fast. <laughs> That's cute. You're lucky you didn't get hurt, though. Yeah, well, I guess I just didn't sense the danger. Actually, I kind of grew up on a farm. Uh, my grandfather had a ranch growing up, so I spent every summer on his ranch. So I have quite the, I don't know, I guess I have a lot of experience. Oh, okay. Farm. Yeah, it's good. I mean, I remember when I was young, I thought the life on the farm was just the best. I mean, I had it so good. And I loved everything about living on a farm. And I thought when I was going to get older, I would want to be on a farm. But now that I'm older, I, I couldn't imagine doing it ever again. Oh, what can't you imagine doing? Uh, I don't know. I, I guess I just couldn't imagine all that work. Um, and I think I'm just so addicted to city life or suburban life uh, and living in a house and just, you know, doing work on computers and things like that. I, I couldn't go back to that lifestyle. But when I was young, I have to admit, I, I enjoyed it a lot. So how about you? Could you see yourself moving and living on a farm? Um, well, yeah, I think my thoughts are similar to yours in that um, I'm very used to being inside using a computer and I'm used to um, a very different lifestyle to one that involves being on a farm. But yeah, I've never had um, a long period of time where I've stayed on a farm like you, so yeah, maybe it's a bit different for me.